In the Intelligent Organization Conference, March 1990, in Monterrey, Mexico, Stafford Beer began by comparing the reductionist scientific paradigm and the cybernetic paradigm. Regrettably, the video of this conference is lost. Fortunately, I preserved an audio to make the transcript. Now you can hear Stafford's voice while I try to reproduce some of the images he drew on the blackboard. So here is Stafford Beer. Well, he hello everybody. The, uh, we are living at a moment, as you, I'm sure, would agree, with quite an incredible change in the world. So, I was saying that uh, I'm talking about mathematical catastrophe, very sudden step functions in the way that society is behaving. Obviously, the, the very uh, distant Eastern Europe is very much in our minds, but it's happening everywhere. I lived to see this morning something I thought would never happen. Uh, Mr. Pinochet removing his sash in Chile. Yes. And, um, and as, we, as we look at this huge field of change, we have to ask ourselves how we are going to adapt to it. Now, it's being said, and it worries me very, very much, that capitalism has defeated Marxism. And people are not observing that capitalism is going very fast into decline as well. We are running on massive deficits, very high levels of unemployment, of inflation, of poverty in the so-called rich world. And it, it worries me that the so-called developing countries may just assume that what they have to do is continue to follow the pattern which I believe is already looking very disastrous in uh, Europe and the United States. Now I may be wrong about that but I don't think I am. <coughs> if you add to that that emerging countries in the, in the Eastern Bloc, people regaining independence, again, we've seen Lithuania only, only yesterday. Uh, if they consider that what they have to do is to copy uh, the, the uh, lines laid down by uh, the United States and Britain and so on, then the world is going to be in the most appalling turmoil. So if, uh, this is my basic belief. You mightn't quite agree with that, but you would have to agree that there is a massive amount of change going on, and I think you would have to agree that maybe we're not too sure how to handle it. That's the minimal statement. Well, it seems to me that if we are going to find a way into thinking about this under the title of intelligent organization, we have to begin by trying to understand how we got to the position we're in. Let's examine, I'll have to do this briefly, we only have the morning, but I would like to begin by examining how we got to be, <coughs> excuse me, it's very early for me. <coughs> how we got to be in what I would call I don't want to pull the machinery apart. I'll pull this over here. We are, I claim, in a reductionist world. Now, you all know what the word means, but I'm anxious to explain why I think it's very important to penetrate it. Let us begin with the structure of knowledge itself. You go back to Aristotle, and you find him saying, that you can divide something between A and not A. And that is Aristotle's principle of non-contradiction, which says you can't be A and not A at the same time. So we began with that. And if you look at A, then you say, well, A divides into X and non-X, and, and so on. And I'm not going to fill the blackboard, it's, it's a, like a family tree. And that's what a reductionist approach means. And that got applied to knowledge. Now, the thing that we observe here is that very large distinctions were made quite early on in knowledge. 
and they have remained with us ever since, and they've been very hard to dislodge. So to, to, to make it short, we have, for instance, physics, chemistry, and biology. And these became known as disciplines, did they not? A strong word. And people in physics didn't know what chemists were doing, and still less what biologists were doing, for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Now we have to ask the question, does God know the difference between physics and biology? So we have started taking apart the cosmos, which is what I'm trying to say, the cosmos as a whole, reductionist style. And then we end up with universities, with departments, after you've gone right down here, many of whom cannot even speak to each other. And you know that is true. You try and get a social scientist, scientist speaking to a physicist, it's going to be very hard work. Now, along with knowledge, we get the process of reason. How do you reason? Well, this develops, again from Aristotle, with the syllogism. Because if you have a major premise, the, the classic one is, all men are mortal, and a minor premise, Socrates is a man, you can deduce, so it's said, that Socrates is mortal. So the syllogism becomes the basis of reasoning. And, you know, I'm trying to get you to look at this in a historical perspective, not because I'm an historian or, or it's interesting, but because I want to, to demonstrate how how thousands of years, and certainly hundreds of years, have made us look at the world in the way we do, and therefore organize things in the way we do. From the syllogism, this premise, that premise, leads to the conclusion. You get the, the sorites, which is the whole chain of how you develop that. And let us remember that uh, the uh, medieval development of science and theology and everything was based on sorites. It was based on the on medieval disputation is the phrase in English. I don't know if you use the same term. Where uh, you, you argue in precisely those terms. You say, you said that, well now I wish to distinguish, was always the word, in what you said between this and this. And then somebody else says, well, all right, but I wish to distinguish between this and this. And off you go again. So then, in the same way, if you start from this kind of basis, you start again with the very important next subject historically of theology. So what do we say now? We say, well, there's God. Mystery. How do we break that down? Well, now, as you know from, from religion, there are all manner of ways of, um, uh, of, from theology, all manner of ways of breaking this down. Again, you tend to get this pattern developing. It got very entrenched in early Christian times, largely, I think, due to St. Paul. And so you come, working upwards, you have people down here, and you build up, and you get, I'm quoting St. Paul, angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, powers all these ranks going up before you get to God. So there's your theology. Then if you want a religion based on your theology, well, obviously, here you go again, you've got a pope, haven't you? And then you've got the, the curia in Rome. And then you've got a whole hierarchy, we actually use the word hierarchy, for the bishops and archbishops and so forth. So this pattern, you see, is getting deeply entrenched in our, uh, <coughs> in our culture. I repeat, it's, we've inherited it and reinforced it by our institutions, and so we come to government. And off we go again, and we've got government doing exactly the same thing, breaking itself up from a king to barons, or from a dictator, to the people he appoints, and, and even in democracies, we have, we have a so-called democratically elected leader broken down into, into divisions. And all this is coming with it. 
That's the interesting thing. Uh, the last one is just management, of which government is a special example, of course. And what I'm arguing is that the whole of this is turning up in here, whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not. And thus, our methods of government and our methods of management are wholly reductionist in their character. Is there any alternative to this? Have you ever seen this symbol of a snake? The Greeks used this symbol. It's called Ouroboros, and it's a snake eating its own tail. Now, this is a different way of looking at the world from reductionism. It is a way of closure. It is a way of putting everything together. And we find it in physics emerging in relativity, which is non-reductionist. And we find it emerging in biology in terms... Let me explain. If I asked you what makes a living thing, I think you are likely to answer that it can reproduce itself. Well, in modern biology, the idea is that it's much more important to, to note the fact that a living organism produces itself. You will have to change every cell in your body within the next seven years, but you will still have to be recognizably yourself. And this is the thing called auto, meaning self, paesis, which is to make yourself. And autopiesis is a new kind of phenomenon in the way biologists are thinking. So both these are, these are the emerging ideas that are contradictory to that. Now, not everybody is, has caught up with this. Why, had, why has it taken? It took well over 50 years before anybody took relativity seriously. It was because you cannot express it in these terms. And we're having much the same trouble with this now, as I'll try and show you later on. As to reasoning, well, I use the term closure. We have the notion of mathematical closure here. This is the new line. Let me put that across primarily through logic. Do you all know Gödel's theorem? Anybody know Gödel's theorem? <coughs> Gödel's theorem in logic says that it is impossible to construct a theoretical language, which is to say a mathematics or a logic, that will not close on itself with the result that there are statements that are undecidable in that language. In other words, the language is the language and there are things you cannot say inside it. Now, this isn't because the police are waiting outside, it's because the logical construction of the language will not permit it. The other thing, so these are, these are mathematical concepts. The philosophical concepts can, come from Hegel. And I would like to, you to take special note of his axiom of internal relations, if you don't know it. <coughs> this sounds complicated, so you take it in pieces. The relations by which terms are related are an integral part of the terms they relate. Do you think you've got that? The relations by which terms are related are an integral part of the terms they relate. So, relativity and Hegel, you see. What that says is that if you had a, a, an elephant as small as a mouse, it wouldn't be an elephant. Because the fact that an elephant is intrinsically Percept, perceived as bigger than a mouse is part of the elephantness of the elephant and part of the mouseness of the mouse. Now that at once produces thoughts about system, which is what I'm talking about today, really, because it all comes down to that in the end. That if you are more concerned about the relatedness of things, than about the hierarchical reductionist approach to things, then you take off from that point and you think about this, the network of relationships rather than the things themselves. Now look at the consequences for that in theology. 
you start by saying, well, we don't have to go to God through all this uh, paraphernalia of, of the church. We can, we can have a gospel base and speak directly to God. And that's where the thing begins with, with people like Quakers and uh, you know, gospel people in the United States and so forth. So that becomes an alternative. But nowadays, again, looking at the relatedness of things, people are thinking much more in terms of, of groups of people, are they not? Um, who embrace each other, new age thinking, all of those kinds of things are replacing uh, the ancient theology. And, you know, when I said that the, the systems we use are collapsing, uh, we tend to resist that when we're talking about politics, economics, management. We tend to think, well, we'll make it work. But just look at the example of theology. Look at the loss of influence and the collapse of that system, as a historical fact, I mean, over the last several hundred years. Uh, the number of people who are operating that system now are very tiny compared with what they were in medieval times, quite obviously. So these are alternative ways of, of looking at things. The theological alternatives here are very ancient. The northern Indian Vedantic philosophy is highly non-reductionist. It is of the systemic kind. And that Vedantic philosophy went, went into Hinduism, which went into Buddhism, which went into Zen. And please note that by the time you get to Zen, you are explicitly denying Aristotle's law of non-contradiction. Because in Zen, the whole perception is that the thing and not the thing are present together. Now, if we're going to look at government here, and of course I'm going to come to this in much more detail after a bit. In contrast to the way government developed through kings and barons and uh, then through, well I won't go through all the hierarchies, you know them, how history has developed. We get contrary calls for independence, for regionalization, for more attention to the, to the city. Now, I'm well aware that these, these things are very much in the minds of Mexicans. I'm very well aware, especially, that the Constitution provides for the financing of the municipality in Mexico to a tune which they, they don't never experience by a very, very long way. So these, these issues are contrary issues to the uh, pressing down of power from above. And I want you to remember what I said about autopoiesis, which is the system that is making itself. How about that? I think that's a pretty good example. Now, when we come to management, which I will discuss in much more detail shortly, but still speaking within this total fr framework of reductionism and its possible contraries, I want to point out something to you that's very, very serious indeed about the way we run our affairs. It is that once, you, once you've got a reductionist model of what you're doing, once you have said the, 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 the welfare of the people consists of education, of health, of welfare, etc., once you said this company is divided into these divisions, once you said we do production, sales, engineering, etc., these are all reductionist models, and they all have tremendous benefits, and they all have tremendous disadvantages. 
But the, the, the logical thrust of this blackboard is telling us that you can't think about anything any longer except in these terms. We have constructed models which have trapped us. We are trapped inside the model. Let me try and explain the serious practical importance of what I'm saying. If you try to produce a plan for an organization, it plan has got, it's, it's forced to be expressed in terms of that organization, which is in terms of the whole reductionist thing that's gone into it. Now, you see, the future that you are planning for might have to be quite different from, what it, from the way things are now. That's usually the case. But you have no way of expressing it, just as in Gödel's theorem. You, you, you can't present the management with a plan that has no relation to their perception of what the organization is. It wouldn't make sense. They'd kick you out. Have done. And uh, I would even like to mention that in things like artificial intelligence and expert systems, which we're paying a lot of attention to, again, if th th they are, we have to note that they are being expressed in terms of, of all of this. Because what is an expert? An expert is someone who knows how all this works. <laughs> so it's precisely his job. Now, these, these matters inhibit change. And when change comes, as it is coming, as I began by saying, in a very big cascading fashion across the world in every field, and if we are only armed with out-of-date models that cannot adapt, we are in very big trouble. I think one of the things that most worries me is that the notion of independence, this one, which everybody is now very... Uh, serious about does not just mean freedom in the sense of doing anything you like because that results in chaos and we have a nice new piece of mathematics now by our side in the shape of uh, Prigogine's work Rennie Tom's work mathematicians here no well, we do. <laughs> we have a lot of new work that deals with a turbulent environment. And by God, we've got a turbulent environment, and we need to seize those mathematical tools and replace some of these old tools. I mean, the mathematical tools that we used here at this stage of the game, namely uh, largely differential calculus, is as reductionist as you can get. And when we first started thinking in cybernetics about the nature of the intelligence, using that, well, you can, you can write a differential equation that goes out and out and out, and it looks good, but you cannot quantify the transfer function. Whether you look inside the brain to do it and the way cells are behaving, or you look behaviorally as a psychologist at the way um, black boxes of rats are behaving, or people for that matter, you get stuck with this, uh, with this same inability to, to focus on a new way of looking at things. Now, I want today to, to focus on a new way of looking at things, a way that we cannot deduce from this, because that's abandoned us to a reductionist approach, but a way which I think we can deduce from this which is the alternative roots of handling human affairs. I'm arguing that we need a new way of entry and a new model to deal with all of this. And I'm going to try and suggest one to you. In the absence of that, what we've got is a culture in which people wish to Ad address the problem of change by, for instance, training. They say, well, we must train everybody. You know, education, training, then it'll all be all right. 
uh, another trick is to say, well, let's reorganize. Hmm. But how? They say, well, we're free now. You know, we've got our independence. We can do it as we like. But can we? Because we're trapped in all this. Now, I've got here a statement I want to read to you, which you may have heard before, about training and reorganization. And it says, we trained hard, but it seemed that every time we were beginning to form up into teams, we would be reorganized. I was to learn later in life that we tend to meet any new situation by reorganizing, and a wonderful method it can be for creating the illusion of progress while producing confusion, inefficiency, and demoralization. Well, this was written by Petronius in 210 BC. <laughs> I thought that might amuse you, it amuses me. Here we are, we're still in the same situation. Of course, I'm not disparaging the notion of independence and freedom itself. We have to... Uh, we have, first of all, to have that before we can start rethinking, that's for sure. We have to make some fundamental statements of belief. And if uh, you've been wondering why I'm wearing this rather extraordinary shirt here today, it is an exact copy of the shirt of Thomas Jefferson, and I thought it would be rather a good gesture to, to wear it <laughs> on this occasion. <laughs> The model I'm going to present to you begins like this. There is a loosely defined environment. And in that environment, there is a process happening. And in that process, there is a management. Now, that I think is, is a true statement for any organization. I'm trying to develop something which will apply to everything we've been looking at. But we could, we could you localize it where you like. You localize it on a church, you localize it on a business, on a company, on a government. I think you will find that you've got a management trying to regulate a process within an environment. Although those things are built into each other, I'm going to split them apart because I want to examine some features of them. There's the environment, there's the process, and there's the management. Now, because they are embedded in each other, we may say, look at that. This has got, the management has got to communicate with its process, with its workers, with its electorate, whatever it is. And the process has to communicate with the environment and say, here we are and this is what we do. And similarly, there's a return loop where the environment is saying to the process, well, that's all very well, but you're polluting the environment, for instance. And the process goes back to the management and reports we are doing what you told us to do, or what we agreed to do, or whatever it is. That's not objectionable, I hope, is it? As a, as a basic structure. I want now to introduce a measure. We are used to measuring everything in terms of what we used to call the four M's. In the 50s, everybody on this kind of podium was talking about men, materials, machinery, money. So this is what you measured. Well, I think that our new way of looking at things tells us, our non-reductionist way of looking at things, tells us that that is itself a reduction. So what is the uniform, basic commodity that we have to deal with in managing, in organizing? Is there one thing underlying the problems of men, materials, machinery, and money? Well, I suggest to you that there is, and th this thing is complexity. Our problem is managing complexity. If, if something is obvious and easy, we just do it. And the more complex it gets, the more hard it is to manage, the more organization we have to put in. And that's where our problems are generated. So if we are trying to deal with complexity, then let us have a measure of complexity. And in cybernetics, that measure is variety. Now, that is a word you all know, and uh, 
It means what it means in ordinary speech. But in cybernetics, we give it a very precise definition because we are trying to develop a science here. And the definition is, of this is the number of possible states of the system. We tend to think that measures have to be precise in management because of the reductionist approach. So we have trained enormous numbers of accountants, enormous numbers of lawyers, and other people of, of that very reductionist shape to look at our operations and measure them, and they do it precisely. So if you say, well, there's supposed to be uh, 10,000 pesos here and there are only 9,999, one is missing. Did you take it or did you? I mean, it's that precise. Well, we can't do that in measuring the number of possible states of the system. But you remember that I invoked relativity theory. I invoked Hegel's axiom of internal relations. And that's what I want to use because I want to argue that the variety that the manager possesses, that little v, supposing we could count it, is definitely less than the variety of the process he's trying to control. You can't argue that, can you? It's bound to be the case. He doesn't know everything about what's going on here. And in the same way, this variety is bound to be bigger than the process variety. So for, we will be using measurement of variety in two ways which are fundamentally different from the reductionist way. The first is that relative statements are helpful and valid. And the second, as you will find later, is that statements of probability are valid. The reason I started with all that business about reductionism is to show that you don't have to defend a new kind of measure if you change the, the epistemology of, of your attack. This kind of thinking gets attacked by people who are defending the old system. And one can see why. Does it matter that these varieties are bigger than each other? Well, the first thing we can see is it's pretty hard for the manager to, to manage something that's bigger in variety. You know, it's, it's an uphill task. And I would like you to think about how he does it. When I say he, I'm talking about a whole management group or a government or any, anybody who is trying to control something, regulate something. If this variety is too small in respect to that, what do we have to do to it? Anyone? Increase it. So let me use the electrical symbol. And I say, well, we have to amplify the variety there. And how do you do that? Well, you have many methods of increasing your managerial efficiency with your workforce, for instance. You provide them with training schemes, and you try to increase that variety. And what, what's the answer on this? Obviously, the electrical symbol for attenuation, we have to decrease the variety that's coming to us. Now, as we have proceeded in management science and the use of computers, I wish to point out to you we have done almost the opposite of this. Because instead of attenuating the variety, we have massively increased it. Because, we have said very proudly, we've put it all into a database, here it comes, whoosh! And you drown the manager in the stuff. And he, poor devil, is sitting there saying, well, I expect there's something very important in all this readout. I wonder what it is. And that is not much of an exaggeration. I've been a manager. I've, I've, I've experienced all that. So we've, we've got the equation upside down because all this massive information coming in here attenuates his ability to do anything about it instead of amplifying it. So clearly, in what's coming, I shall have to be able to convince you that, that the model I'm going to be talking about can handle that. Now, you'll notice we have exactly the same thing going on here. You're running a business. How do you amplify what you do into the environment? Advertising, perfect example. Market research. The advertising market research here. Well, I find that a very nice model because 
I, I say in the, you heard about a book called Brain of the Firm, which was published in 1972. That book says <coughs> that every single management technique you can think of is fundamentally, in terms of variety, one of these four things. And I've listed most of them. Can it, would anybody like to give me an example of a, mani a, a standard management technique, the sort of thing? So it's there, isn't it? Because it, because it, uh, it gives you the optimal. So optimization is such a technique. Um, management by objectives is, is, that's the sort of word I wanted to get from you, is such a, a technique. And we've already spoken of advertising and so forth. Well, in all the years since 1972, which is nearly getting on for 20 years, nobody has ever said, no, you're wrong, we do it this way, and you can't explain that like this. So I've got a lot of confidence in this as the basis, excuse me, of my model. Now, we have stumbled in the course of that inquiry onto what I regard as the major law in cybernetics. And I'll write the name of the discoverer, and I would very much like you to remember this out of today, if nothing else. Has anybody ever heard of that before? Yes, good. But it's a small minority. <laughs> you see, what this is saying is that only variety can absorb variety. You must have requisite variety. You've just seen me creating that situation on the blackboard. We have just been organizing Ashby's Law in front of our eyes. Now, the point about the, it being called a law is that it will exert itself. Laws, laws of nature, I hate the term, but never mind, it, it's shorthand. Laws of nature work because they are always operative and you can't stop them. I can't stop this chalk disobeying the law of from obeying the law of gravity if I leave go of it. So Ashby's law will always come out. And the way it comes out is in chaos very often. If you imagine some policeman trying to direct the traffic, you know, by waving his arms about, and there's much traffic and some of it's round the corner and he can't see it, he hasn't got requisite variety. So you get a, a gridlock, you get a traffic jam. Because Ashby's law will, will abs by Ashby's law, the situation will absorb the variety one way or another. If you've got an efficient signaling system, you can absorb the variety of the traffic by clever signaling, by switching this lane on, that lane on. It's what we do. But if you don't have an efficient si switching system, if the policeman cannot absorb the variety, the variety is, is, is absorbed by this law in stationary behavior. You stop. So that's a very simple example. Another very simple example, and far more serious, is how do finance ministers try and run the economy? You know, think about it for a minute. They try to control the money supply if they belong to Milton Friedman. If they try and work through controlling interest rates. And that's about it. Do you seriously think that has requisite variety? So how does Ashby's Law come out in that case? It comes out, whatever provisions you make in a reductionist sense in the Finance Act, for taxation purposes, you will find that the, the business public with its lawyers and its accountants and so forth has much more variety than you can put into the law. And it goes like that because the requisite variety will, will turn up. So it suggests straight away that, I mean, I have, I've watched this process all my life, the Finance Act amendments and amendments as people try to stop the holes that people are ducking through and the result is that 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 now you need the requisite variety is put into the situation by the 
total professions devoted to the law of taxation and the taxation accounting and so forth, which is putting variety back, isn't it? Because if, if, you are, if you have complex affairs, as an individual even, you are going to have to pay someone to file your tax return because the law is so difficult that you can't deal with it because you're doing something else. It's not necessarily that you couldn't, but you cannot devote your life to paying your taxes. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any taxes to pay. <laughs> So I, I, I'm hoping to excite you about this notion. If you think of any situation, you, you practice you know, on your own, and say, my God, that doesn't work because of Ashby's law. Or we are trying to make it work with a regulatory system that, that doesn't embody Ashby's law. Then you suddenly start clicking and you say, wow, no wonder we've got this wrong. Now, one of the ways that Ashby's law was dealt with in society was by oppression. You know, if, it, if it's illegal to do something, and by illegal I don't just mean that you can disobey the law and get away with it, I mean you get thrown into jail or shot. If you're in that kind of regime, then that is Ashby's law working, as I said earlier, with amplifiers on this loop. But if you release that, and that's what's happening in the world, getting away from tyranny, away from dictatorship, and into independence, what you are going to have is a boiling mass of variety being churned up, which we've never experienced before, and we do not know how to regulate it. That's why I began by saying we were in, in a pretty serious state. I want to take what I've just done as a basic building block of a big organization, which has parts. So, this is what we just did, and that's a part of a larger organization. And here's another part. Their environments overlap, their processes are connected, their management systems are connected. And let's have another one. So now we've got a building block for a big organization consisting of parts. Please understand this isn't a hierarchy, it's just that because I have a blackboard here I have to put them in some kind of order. Alphabetical order, it doesn't matter. So these are the divisions of a company. All they are health, education, etc., branches of government. They are anything you like. They could be the members of family, for that matter. <coughs> now, what, what can we say about a variety here? And what do I mean by a big organization? Well, I want to define for you a big organization, and I give it the name of the viable system. Let us be very precise about what viable means. It means capable of independent existence. And the word actually gets into the language through um, obstetrics. The fetus becomes viable when it can be, divor be divorced from the mother and survive. So that's, that's before nine months, you know. It's, when the thing is, when the fetus is capable of being on its own, then it's viable. Now, this applies in this model in that I want to consider an organization which has a surviving identity. Mexico has been Mexico for a long time. It's had certain changes made to its boundaries, but it's recognizable. It's called Mexico. And it's going to be, uh, go on being called Mexico. Now, and the same goes for the, if these were the regions of Mexico, the states. Uh, Chihuahua is Chihuahua, and so forth. 
So I'm, I'm rather anxious to make it clear that I'm talking about a kind of independence which isn't absolute. There is no such thing as absolute independence for an organization or an individual because we are members one of another, to quote the Bible. I can't operate without the help of other people, nor can you. But we are still ourselves. So it's rather a subtle notion about the identity. The notion of identity is itself rather subtle. But having said that, I shall go on to consider this as if it were uh, on its own. <coughs> the things we have here are the things that make up the essence of the viable system. I mentioned the states of Mexico, for example. The divisions of a company, for example. The wards of a hospital, for example. The faculties of the university, for example. This is a universal model. And up here we have something which we call the management. Now, what is all that about? Why do we need a management? Well, you see, it's obvious when you start thinking in terms of the law of requisite variety. These guys who are managing on the horizontal axis are fighting a problem of bigger and bigger variety and as we have just seen and we've studied the mechanism it is quite a difficult job to maintain enough variety to manage your horizontal operation. So if somebody comes down from on top of you and says do it this way they are, aren't they? taking variety away from you which you cannot afford to give them because you need it. Now, you see, here we have the explanation of this vital word and it's going to be more and more vital as in the change, changing world we're discussing. People seek autonomy. States seek autonomy. Nations seek autonomy. I seek autonomy. Now, if we maintain the cohesion of the whole thing by reducing variety on this line, which means making laws, forcing people to do what they don't want to do, then, of course, it makes us very inefficient this way. And this is a very straightforward explanation at the fundamental level of why Russia, the Soviet Union, has collapsed. It did all that central planning in the hope of getting efficiency coming out of here. But the, that planning, of course, doesn't have requisite variety. Obviously, it couldn't possibly have. You must decentralize in order to get that kind of efficiency. The result is no food, no, no clothing, no nothing. Collapse. Now, before we congratulate ourselves on having solved that problem, I'm glad that response. You see, we don't do it in that aggressive way, but we do it in other ways. Uh, we come along and, and, uh, and give a loan to Mexico. You don't mind me changing my example all the time. I'm trying to convince you that this model is universal. <laughs> So along comes the rich world and gives some loans to Mexico with the idea, if this is Mexico, of allowing this process to happen. But in the course of doing so, the IMF reduce the variety and make it impossible for Mexico to do the job. That's a very simple explanation and it needs books to be written to, ex to prove it and so forth. But I've been working in Mexico on and off and I've seen it, I've watched it. I've been in the ministries and seen how it works. And uh, it's the same explanation. So this interference with autonomy is going to affect the so-called free world very fast. You cannot run the whole thing on deficit just for a beginning. And why not? It's, it's not just that that's bad economics and that the, the people have to pay a third of their income to finance a debt, which is clearly awful. 
But it's not just that economic fact. It's at the more fundamental level, none of that process has requisite variety. So we have to find one that does, and I believe we can. So that would cheer up. Now, the point of uh, the, the, the underlying and but very important point about autonomy is this. If I am proving my case, as I hope I am to you, that we should not reduce the variety on this vertical scale, this vertical axis, because we need all the variety we've got here, then why reduce it at all? Why do we have to say anything? Well, now, the answer to that in terms of, uh, of cybernetics is, is perfectly clear, isn't it? If each of these people is autonomous, then there is nothing to say that what this man does will be uh, coherent with what this man does. There is nothing in the model so far to say that these people will not produce contradictory plans. Plans which maximize each performance but do not maximize the total performance. Now, if you allowed that situation to happen, this, the viable system would explode. So I have proved by that argument that you must have some variety attenuation on that line. Then the question is, of course, how much? Now, I've just been criticizing both, uh, both halves of the world, if you like, for different forms of using too much variety reduction at that point. So can we propose a, a rule which would say how much? Well, I, I, I can and I do. And I call it, this is my law, and I'll write it down. It is the law of cohesion, which says that in a viable system, just as much variety reduction occurs here as is required to keep the identity of the whole intact, to keep the cohesion, stop it blowing up. Now that is a very delicate balance. I have been in companies as a consultant where, I, I'm sorry, I have very little idea of where you come from. Are, are there any psycho psychologists here? Social, work, uh, social people. Ha <laughs> ha. What about theory X and theory Y? You know that? The, the, the theory X where you have a lot of power coming down here and theory Y which is very liberal. Well, I wanted to use those terms. I have been in companies where I've talked to the board of directors, first of all, up here, and, um, and they say, well, we used to be theory X. We, we were strong management. And then we all went to Harvard Business School and we came back and we're theory Y managers now. So this place is terribly liberal and we don't tell anybody what to do. And uh, we hope they consult us from time to time because we're the management, but they never seem to want our advice anyway. <laughs> it's a very sad state of affairs up here. Then, then I have visited these divisional components. What do I find? I find everybody with the newspaper open looking through the job advertisements. They say, oh, <laughs> what's the matter here? I, I, this damn place, they say. You can't do a thing. You have to get permission for everything. You have to get signatures, and it's awful. I'm off. Now, what's going on, you see? There's, it's the same place we're talking about. But the downward perception is different from the upward perception, and it's different at that point. So it means we have to define that point very carefully. And as long as we're talking about autonomy and, and nice neutral words like that, it's fine. <coughs> but when we bring it up to the political level, and we, it's the same th problem, but we start calling it freedom and oppression, 
And, and these are emotive words with a vengeance. I mean, people will die for these, these kind of concepts. So wouldn't it be a good idea to try and get this design correct? I think that people do accept that there has to be some central conception that will lead to the cohesion of the country, or of the city, or of the firm, or of the individual's life. If we have no uh, central co conception of our own identity, we are schizophrenics by definition. We're ill. Well, we've got schizophrenic countries here. So I, I really um, put to you this, this notion that autonomy, and here I come out with it, you see, against all the emotive words, autonomy is a really a computable function of the system, determined against this principle. Now, if, if you tell a guerrilla that he's a, he's a computable function, now he'd probably shoot you. But, <laughs> But it doesn't alter the facts. Now, I, I've used the phrase that autonomy is a computable function. But a co computable function of what? See, it's not a, a function of cohesion itself. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to be cohesive. But what is it a computable function? What is autonomy a computable function of? And I want to give you a, little, a couple of little scenarios to try and bring this point out. Let us suppose, as people in this room, that we decide we dislike one of the public monuments in the city. And we, we agree, quite illegally, and I'm not suggesting we do this, <laughs> we agree to go and blow it up. <laughs> well done. <laughs> now, what, how, do, how are we going to do this? Well, we've got to create this system to, to, for doing it. This is, this is a system consisting of us, and we all sign the document, to, to do this do uh, terrible deed. Well, now we're going to have to break up into sections. First of all, we need some bombs. You people know how to make bombs. You go and make the bombs. Hmm? Uh, then we've got the logistics. How do we get there? Um, where are the police? All of that stuff. Will you go and study that? Then we've got, to, we've got to get there, and we've got to get away. You're the getaway car experts. Hmm? And so we go on, and, and now we've got it all organized. Now, what I'm trying to get at is this. How much autonomy have you sections got left once we've agreed to do the job? Virtually none. Because if you, if you don't deliver the bombs at the right time to the guys with the cars, then it's not going to work. So you can't suddenly say, well, I think I'll go to the pictures and bring the car tomorrow. <laughs> so you have abandoned your autonomy. So your autonomy is a computable function of what is the general word here? Speak out, sorry. You're getting, somebody said it. Yes, I was, the word I was going to use was purpose because it's a little more general than objectives, which sounds like a list. The purpose of the system is to commit this act, and your autonomy is a computable function of the purpose. Now then, let's take a second scenario. We are all here, we are nice people, and we decide to form a society for loving each other. Hmm? Now, what are, the, what are the divisions of this society? So, these people are doing it their way, these people are doing it their way, these people are doing it their way, see? So all that's perfectly permissible. The only thing that isn't permissible, I suppose, to make the, the thing into a cohesive society is that anybody caught hating anybody will be thrown out, okay? Now, how much autonomy have you got? Limitless, virtually, except for this hate clause. Virtually limitless autonomy, you've got the same model but the degree of autonomy measured by this law will be totally different depending on the purpose of this society. 
I believe it's the same group, isn't it, Carlos, that we're going to, to discuss education this afternoon. Well, I might as well make the point right now that if you want to talk about education, you've got to agree first what kind of society you want, and nobody ever does. And this is the reason. Nobody ever does. They talk about uh, how nice it would be to have uh, more engineers and less lawyers and all that kind of talk. But because of this, I mean, is the purpose of Mexico uh, to become a sort of latter-day United States one day? Or isn't it? And if it isn't, then why copy all those systems? So the notion of purpose is, is quite central here. Right, well, I call this the part that's on the board at the moment, that system one. Now, system one is a subsystem of the variable system, and that's it. And now you know something about it. And if we don't want to boss it around, if we don't want to lower its autonomy, we are going to have to deal with the fact that without wishing to, without being offensive to each other, these people come to conclusions which do not fit. If I maximize myself here, you maximize yourself here and you here, there's no guarantee that these things will fit together. <coughs> Take a production situation. If out of my pro if I maximize myself here, you maximize yourself here and you here, there's no guarantee that these things will fit together. <coughs> Take a production situation. If out of my process on this line, I am feeding you some product and you process it and you feed it through and these people process it, like iron into steel into strip or crude oil into refined oil and so on. Then I do some linear programming or whatever you like as an optimization procedure and I say well I will take in my input every Friday and give my output every Monday to these people. But these people meanwhile are saying well I will call for this in a completely different schedule. I can't remember what I said now. And I will give it to these people then. And you can see that with, the, with perfectly good management integrity, these people will all come to different plans vis-a-vis -vis the flow through here. Now, to deal with that, we have something which we call production control. And that is what I call system two which instead of coming slogging down here and reducing the autonomy of these people, and this is a subtle point, is in fact a service to these people with a view to controlling oscillation in the whole program. Now, this is a very difficult point, I find, for people to understand because there is some sense and interference in what these people are planning to do. But it is, it is not of, of a, an oppressive kind, it is of a service kind. Now, my favorite example to show how unoppressive it is, is take the timetable in an ordinary school. The timetable is the thing that says, this class will be in this room with this teacher at this time. Now, without the timetable, all the teachers may, may go to one place and all the students to another place and half the rooms will be empty and half of them will have people sitting on the stairs here. So what would you do if that happened? One um, commanding kind of teacher would get up and say, tell you what, uh, Mr. Bloggs and Mrs. So-and-so, you take all your people down there and down there. But meanwhile, in another room, another commanding teacher is, is saying the opposite. Now, this is what I mean by uncontrolled oscillation. Because you could spend the whole period with people rushing around corridors trying to find the right place to sit. Sometimes this even happens, so it's not all that unrealistic. <laughs> so we have the timetable to say, no, it's, it's all very simple, really. You'll be there on that time, and it'll work. 
So, and production control I gave you as an example. And when we come to the state, you see, a lot of things the state tries to do are of this kind. They're attempts to stop oscillations, inter interpayments, uh, in, uh, for instance, in, uh, in budgetary terms between regions. Uh, these kinds of things are trying to stop wars breaking out. You know, they're just trying to, uh, I mean, wars of economic kind with any luck. Um, they're trying to, to damp the oscillation in the system. But if you're not very careful, they look like oppression. And why is that? I'll tell you, it is because those simple systems are allowed to grow into massive bureaucracies. That's the problem. And once they're there, you can't shift them. And that is because they are trying to become a viable system themselves. And they are, usually. I'm sure they are in Mexico. Eh? Well, they're not supposed to be a viable system. This is the viable system, and these guys are viable systems. This is supposed to be a service. But it becomes an end in itself. Now, if you remember the word autopiesis I had written here, which says you make yourself if you're a viable system, that is what those people are trying to do. They are trying to make themselves be a viable system in their own right. And that is pathological. That is the pathology of a viable system. And I know from first-hand experience that this country is much afflicted by this kind of cancerous growth. So system one, system two, would that be enough? Do we need any more? I am trying, you see, to construct a model which, in the classic words, is necessary and sufficient. Well, it's necessary to have your basic units. It's necessary to have a control of oscillation. Do we need anything else? Well, I say that we do. We need here a system three to do this job we were talking about. And why should we need, why should we need a, something that looks superior? Well, does anyone want to answer that? Why do, why do we need something more than we've got? Yes, it's a form of coherence, isn't it? The thing is that uh, until we put that in, nobody can see the whole picture. Pardon? Oh, the environment's out here. I'm, I'm talking about being able to see the state of all these three things at once, simultaneously. These people can't do it by definition. They're, they're doing this. The purpose has to be clear, and also the machinery for effecting it has to be clear. Now, let, let, me, let me say, well, I've been talking about keeping this uh, reduction of variety to a minimum. But you see, if you're going to get anything like efficient behavior out of this, you're likely to want to modify what these people would do without knowing the total picture. Isn't that so? So if you were going to do a linear program on the whole thing, you'd have to do it in here. Because these people haven't got the information. They can do each a linear program. Not that I'm ad advocating linear programming <laughs> particularly. <laughs> I'm not. So I'm trying to prove that you must have a one, you must have a two, and now you see you must have a three. Well, is that enough? Well, the argument now goes this way, that because of the, the rate of change, perhaps, or because of the uh, awfulness of people, or because of the way that variety is constantly generated in the institution, these people find themselves working in very short time. They are what we say crisis managers. They never have time to think because all this is boiling away, generating variety which has to be met by Ashby's law. 
Now, I, I think, may, uh, do you agree that, that much of our problem is, it comes about through having to deal with uh, short, very short-term um, issues? And this is much uh, um, exaggerated by um, the current use of the media. You know, the, the media comes bang into the living room, says this, the minister has to react instantly. In the, in the business, the workers uh, start making a fuss and uh, bang, the police lot has to get in there and, and try and solve the problem. And uh, in doing that, by the way, it has to come straight into the process. So that's another kind of intervention that it will make to deal with crisis and generally to look into those problems, but trying all the time to keep off this line so we've got a very much a, a question of perception here in, in how people perceive, like the example I gave you where the, the, the people were looking for jobs up this way and, and the different perception downwards. So I've tried to show this one, two, three thing to you. And I'm asking now, why have I also got a four? Well, I've given you the answer already. It is because, inevitably, these people get caught in the trap of firefighting, we often say, don't we? Of, of putting out fires, of dealing with emergency. They are in crisis mode. <coughs> so we've got to recognize some activity which is not in crisis mode and which can take a look at the outside world. Now. The outside world is not just, this is outside world to him and this to him. You remember these environments. But the outside world to the whole system is more than the sum of these environments, isn't it? There's more to the world than the world as perceived by this piece of the business, plus this, plus that. Agreed? And also, out here, we have the concept of the future environment, not just the present environment. There is embedded in the present environment a future environment which is emerging and which we'd better be aware of. And the whole uh, green movement has just realized that. A damn sight too late. So I am saying, well, let's make that division. Now, please, please be aware at this point that this is not an organization chart. I think I said that before. It is an attempt to find out what necessary and sufficient conditions are of viability. And if, having made this division, which I don't like to make because I don't like divisions, because I'm not a reductionist, but if we have to make a division, I submit to you that this is, is biologically sound. If you look at your own body, you find the old part of the brain from here, the, the cerebellum, the pons, the medulla, this part going down into the spinal cord, is actually called the autonomic nervous system. Why? Because it operates without conscious intervention. So that's the system three running the two and the one. Um, on the other hand, I, I mean, none of us would be here unless we had a system for a part of the brain, which is the midbrain and the cortex, capable of, of deciding to be here today, which is not just in response to something that's happening down here. Um, and we wouldn't have any moral uh, considerations about the world, which are even more removed from, from immediate uh, business of living if, uh, if we didn't have a neocortex, a, a frontal lobe that is constantly uh, communing with its, itself or with God or however it is about morality and ethics and the purpose, uh -huh, there's that word again, of life itself. So we see 
Uh, yes, before, uh, I was just talking about the person there, but you see it in species too at that level. Um, there are things about uh, all animals, all living things, which are devoted to survival of the individual and others which are devoted to the survival of the species, as we know from studies of evolution. So uh, this division is, is not that uncommon. So I've accepted it and put it in this model. But of course, the minute you make a, di a distinction, if you are not going to get trapped by Aristotle's law of non-contradiction, so that you are either three or four, then you have to make a very strong connection loop round there. Now, <laughs> talking about being trapped by Aristotle at that point, Let me take that at the personal and the organizational level, too. See, in organizations, you call in a very expensive consultant and you say, we're in trouble, what shall we do? And the consultant says, you're decentralized and therefore you're not cost effective. You must have much be, be, you must be centralized, have a common purchasing department, and then you will be able to buy ballpoint pens at half the unit cost. So you, you change the whole thing, and, and that's just great. And then you find that uh, things are not working out so well, and you get another firm of expensive consultants, and they say, ha, ah, we observe you're very centralized, and this is inhibiting uh, local ability, and you must decentralize. And it's, it's serious. I, I mean, I don't know if you've seen this stuff, but it's like a pendulum that goes on in big companies. I've seen it all over the world. Well, take it at the personal level. If I was centralized, I would have to re remember to tell my heart to beat and my lungs to breathe. And I'm talking to you, I should forget I'd fall dead on the stage here. It'd be very impressive, you wouldn't forget this lecture if I did that. <laughs> if, on the other hand, I were totally decentralized, instead of consciously being embarrassed by having to take sips of water, my need for, for fluid might send me leaping up those stairs and out of the building to the nearest bar. And then you'd all be sitting here looking silly. So obviously, in biological terms, th there is no such thing as this battle between central and decentral, or between now and the future. They have to be fused, and that is a systemic concept and not really approachable through reductionist models, is it? So having come rather near a piece of reductionism, I am marking these circles, this loop, very, very strongly. And I see an awful lot of business collapse and uh, national failure coming about through an inability to balance investment between these two functions. If, uh, let me make it clear, investment Okay, money, but time, care, attention, skill, that's what I mean by investment. Put it all into the future and this collapses behind you. And, and your bridges fall down and your motorways fall down, your buildings fall down. You've seen all of that in Mexico. Not that you were investing in the future, you didn't have the money for other reasons. Um, so you mustn't do that. On the other hand, if you put all your effort, all your investment into keeping this going, how will you ever adapt to a changing environment and you starve this function? So keeping that balance is so important that I reached the end of my line with system five. Now, system five is usually thought of in the reductionist model as the boss. The buck stops here. I am the president, I am the managing director, and most of what I've said so far can be accommodated by, well, Mr. Boss, go steady on the, on the amplification of, uh, of your um, variety, because you will be seen to be oppressive. So you say, well, if, if the boss is not that kind of boss, 
in other words, we are in a democracy, if we are. What's his job? Well, I say that his main function is to monitor that balance. And there we have the entire viable system model very briefly presented. I like to take a week to do that, but I expect you're glad I don't. <laughs> now, I wonder if it's got clear to you while we've been doing this that each of these things is a viable system. System one has to be a viable system. In other words, it could be removed. We could take that ironworks out and run it as a separate organization. We could take the steelworks out and we could take the rolling mill out. We keep them together with the common purpose of making more money this way. is a viable system, is in principle capable of independent existence. The production control system is capable of independent existence. If these guys go away, there's nothing to do. The management has nothing to do with these, these guys have gone away. So none of two, three, four, or five is a viable system. Now you try telling a board of directors or the government of the country that they're not a viable system and they get very unhappy. <laughs> but it's true, you see, they are a service. Now think what that does for your principles of democracy. I'd love to tell the story. You, I, think you, I think you heard that I was in Chile. Did you mention that? No. I was with, in Chile with uh, President Allende. And I, I put this whole thing into Chile. Uh, on a very big scale. We can talk about that later if you wish. But I drew this model for Salvador Allende on the, the coffee table between us, you know, a very intimate thing. And I got to here, and I was going to begin by saying, compañero presidente, mm -hmm. but before I could say it, he leant back, he leant right back, and he said, ah, el pueblo. It, it, it shivers down their spine and still does just to repeat it because that is a, a model which most people would think was a hierarchy and he at once saw that because I because it was a total system that the, 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 the people empowerment here was what mattered and that is a, a marvelous definition I think of democracy getting near the recess time which gives me just the chance to show you one slide. Uh, I'd shown you this at the beginning. Oh, yes, thank you. If I'd shown you this at the beginning, I think you would have had a fit. But now it should all be very simple. <laughs> Not a bad, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's done then. Recognize it? Here we have five, four, three, okay? And the homeostatic link. I haven't talked about homeostasis, but that's what it is. This, this linking together, cross it. This, this linking together of uh, three and four, there's system two, there's that one coming down. And these things are the ones we have horizontal. The management, the process, the environment. Management, process, environment. But now you notice the point. Get the mic. Pardon? The microphone. Oh, thank you. <coughs> the point, of course, is that, as I've said, each of these is a viable system. And look at it. Five, four, three, two. Management, process, environment. My next trick is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the power of this model. And it leads to the principle of recursion of viable systems, which says every viable system contains in viable systems and is contained in a viable system. Because if we turn this on its side at that angle, the whole thing, we should then find that this was part of something else. 
So if, 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 if this is uh, a university, uh, these are faculties, turning on its side, it's a university in a population of universities, or in the whole of education, or whatever. Tertiary education, next one secondary, the next one primary. So this is how we propose to build organizations that are intelligent, because they obey the fundamental principles of fireability as I have been outlined. Now you do please remember that this is just an introduction. There are four whole books about this. Uh, which you are very welcome to read, of course. <laughs> anyway, if you've got the basic thing, I've got just where I wanted to by dot on. Up up then, we have to recess, there it is, and we'll pick it up from there after the break. Thank you very much.